All right, guys. So welcome, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm so excited to have y'all here today for the psychosocial stressors for adults and teens living with BDMD with Dr. Natalie Truba. Dr. Truba, we had you here last year uh, covering the same topic for children. And man, I cannot tell you how much it has helped our community uh, when we've been sharing it in social media and across the web. Um, so many parents have been saying, yes, yes, yes. And it's like this light bulb is going off and they don't feel quite so alone anymore, <laughs> um, which is wonderful. And I've had uh, so many people say that they're gonna share it with their schools, which is fantastic. Um, so just so grateful for your insight and your experience. And um, I'm also really grateful that you welcome conversation. So I, I love that about you. Thank you, thank you. Um, and then one thank you to uh, our sponsor, Leona Phyllis, Phyllis Law Firm. She is uh, in court today, uh, but she will be joining us as soon as she possibly can. All right, take it away, Dr. Truba. All right, well, yeah, I'm Natalie. I am excited to be here with you guys today to kind of do what I hope is the first talk of many um, as it relates to adolescents and adults. So you guys are my first group that I've really kind of had the opportunity to talk with these things and so i'm not gonna lie i selfishly kind of use this talk a little bit to organize my own thoughts and observations and, and anecdotal experiences i'm having more and more over the last couple of years with adults um uh, because we have to start somewhere and so what i really hope today is is kind of for many of you probably you're like duh no kidding like we already know this um because i would love insights and any sort of anything that you would like to share i would i would really appreciate today um so that as we are putting together what what do we need to be doing and what is good and how do we need to think and prepare and what can we do to be helpful that we're doing that through your lens and not our lens because i i will talk about that quite a bit here and, and how that's the problem um so sorry i have a new desk set up sorry things a little bit wonky getting used to it uh, so probably my goals are today, I'm going to kind of provide a little bit more overview of dystrophin isoforms in the brain and kind of their role in the brain, identify common experiences that I know of or that are shared with me commonly um, during adolescence and adulthoods and kind of identify um, separately from that childhood, maybe why we see some different behavioral phenotypes in adolescence and, and sort of how the adolescence period and particularly the high school time um, sets us up either well or, or doesn't set us up that well for the next stage of life, depending on how we navigate that. I'm going to identify what I call elephants in the room for each section. So things that um, I feel like are here, but we don't often either talk about directly or we kind of dance around sometimes or um, are kind of things that are impactful, but that are kind of hard to, to label or to put words to all the time. Um, and then just identify basic strategies for managing some of the stressors. Um, but I feel like this is really where a lot of you will probably have a lot more insights and, and ways of doing things that a we will learn from each other and b I think will be very helpful as we push push this topic forward in the community because it is a it's a very big need. Um, so I'm going to start by talking a little bit about dystrophin in the brain. And so dystrophin isoforms are um, are abundant in the brain for healthy adults, and there's uh, very unique types of dystrophin, and they have. Um, unique rules. So as you all know, probably a lot about DP-427. Um, we also know that DP-427 has a role in the brain, a very similar sort of role uh, as, as it does in the muscles and how it sort of anchors actin and, and helps kind of like with structuring glucocorticoid sort of um, protein complexes, has a similar function synaptically in GABAergic places um, uh, or helping with the GABAergic neurons. And so um, DP-427, um, in the GABAergic center anyways, so forget what I just said because that's the wrong isoform. So DP-427 in the, in the GABAergic center, which is kind of the calming center. So it's the, 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 the it's a neurotransmitter that kind of helps shut down aspects of arousal. And so everybody that has DMD is void of DP-427. And so what, what we can kind of speculate is that like, there's really something going on in the brain that really hyper primes you all to not have maybe the calmest brains as possible, right? DP140 is expressed predominantly prenatally, and it's expressed in abundance in pre, prenatal development and really understood to kind of help scaffold and, and help the brain develop and structurally and how it kind of like works together. Um, 
after birth, it's produced very low levels, but we still see it in the adult healthy brain in the cerebellum. About half of the patients with DMD are diagnosed with lacking DP140 as well, in addition to DP427. DP71 is the most abundant isoform expressed in the adult healthy brain. And this one is particularly important. This is the one that binds um, uh, to our uh, postsynaptic glutamatergic receptor sites and is really involved in helping that glutamatergic center kind of like be overly active, we think. And so that it kind of primes your brain to be that kind of what I call hijacked or, or kind of um, overly excitable, right? And so if you're not making, you know, you don't have a good GABAergic center process and then you have kind of an excitatory glutamatergic, like that in and of itself is kind of a recipe for disaster. And then if your brain has potentially been impacted as you develop, um, that's like a triple whammy, right? And so then we have this rare group of boys that has lacking DP71 and DP40. And we know that that seems to be associated with reduced cere cerebral blood flow um, and blood vessel development. Um, and so that's a, a smaller portion. But so in the, the majority, you know, we're thinking DP427, DP140, and DP71. And DP71 may be having the biggest effect for our boys with regards to excitability. Although um, I think we could say these other things are also probably pretty important when it comes to, to why the brain is kind of excitable. When we look at our mice, what we start to see is like some actual really weird similarities and mice are very basic creatures. And so we don't want to extrapolate too far, but I think it's important to kind of say, you know, um, there's something going on here, right? And I think we can all agree because you guys live this life. So what we know about the MDX mouse, the mouse that you know, does not have DP427 only is that these little dudes have very exaggerated starter responses. So not only to really like kind of moderate stimuli, but even like kind of low stressors, they have a really heightened freeze response. And that freeze response lasts much longer than it would for a wild type mouse. And so mice, you know, when they fight, flight, freeze, they freeze because that's what mice do. But humans can kind of fight, flight or freeze. Like we can do much more complex things when we kind of have that arousal process um, or when we, when that exaggerated startle response is happening. When we do DP4, one, four, DP427 and 140, which is the other most prominent kind of combination of loss there, um, we see in, in, enhanced generalized anxiety in the mice, but we also see an even more severe fear startle response versus the original MDX mouse. Um, and so that that's a lot of the boys, like these two pieces, right? So I think at baseline, we can say, well, if our boys are anywhere similar to our, our mice in any way, which they do seem similar in this regard, that like at baseline, right, we can probably safely guess that the majority of boys are going to have some sort of aspect of trouble regulating, at least to things that are sudden and acute and not predicted. We know our boys show increased startle response to threats. Um, and this is identified and kind of known to be linked to that, the areas that we have sort of dystrophin deficiency in areas like the amygdala, the limbic system. And that's kind of one space that dystrophin is kind of expressed differentially in the brain and humans. We also know that when boys are not producing dystrophin in their brain or maybe not full length, they're not as much dystrophin as we want, that they also have pronounced social skills in relation to facial recognition because they don't do great with kind of quickly discriminating and processing and, and accurately sort of attending to facial, um, facial affect expression. And so, you know, and that's, you know, chicken and egg sort of thing, right? Like, are we so anxious and so kind of heightened that we misinterpret you know, other people's social cues or because we're um, and not interpreting right, are we anxious? Um, but it's really, you know, kind of hopefully just, you know, when our brains are there and we're primed and then we also maybe lack some of that feedback loop that helps us be like, oh yeah, no, that's actually, you know, they're, they're not really mad at me. Like, you know, that's X, Y, Z. That can be really hard to navigate social situations and it can become very confusing um, because then sometimes things just don't make sense to you because, um, messaging is incongruent. Like you might feel like they're being really mean to you, but like they're smiling or something like that because there's like this mismatch and, and things. So um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of really good data coming out just about the fact that the emotional behavioral and learning problems that y'all have been seeing for years are affecting you are super real and are really challenging and very much related to the very important role that dystrophin plays, not only just in the body, but in the brain. And so I'm sure many of you have seen this visual that I use. And um, 
I'm showing you because as normative sort of physiological arousal patterns keep us here, those things I'm just talking about, about like dystrophin in the brain and those types of things are the reason why we see more of a physiological pattern of arousal like this for these dudes. And this is really prominent in childhood. Like we kind of see a, a sort of a, what I affectionately term like behavioral chaoticness when they're, when they're younger, that kind of like pans out a bit when they're older. But the anxiety and the emotional sort of uh, intensity of, of some of their experiences, particularly with anxiety-like sort of things, um, doesn't really go away. That, that kind of persists, but the, but the behavioral sort of like intensity of how they manifest that kind of does kind of shift. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that that we could speculate that just have to do with weakening muscles and ability to actually like, you know, behave chaotically. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not still going on in the body. And that's because over time, the more that your body is under chronic stress, the more that your body then stays in a distressed mode um, because it doesn't fully recover. And so then you start to have stressors that are really minor stressors, even not even just moderate. And you have a, a really big sort of inappropriate sympathetic response or sort of arousal response or fight or flight response. And then you actually don't end up shutting all the way down if you live in a really heightened level. And over time, what will happen to people is they actually kind of like, you know, the next time you have a response, you kind of appear, right? And then you're not going to fully recover. And the next time you're like up here and then you don't fully recover. And over time, all of a sudden we have, you know, something small can bring you all the way up here. And then you're not even really going to come back down to a place of a good baseline for you. Um, and that's incredibly stressful to the body. And when we're getting into later adolescence and adulthood and anxiety, and from an anxiety standpoint, a lot of times, like sometimes what we're dealing with is this sort of a chronic pattern that is really, um, challenging to kind of help restructure just, you know, easily. And so it's a real, it, it does get harder sometimes. Um, and it's biological in a lot of ways. And so even though it makes them very frustrating and challenging and uh, irritating at times, um, there really is a biological driver often for maybe why it seems a little bit more intense over small things than maybe when they were kids. And so when we move into adolescence, we have to remember that adolescence is an incredible important period from a critical learning standpoint, not only just because puberty is a hell of a drug and does a bunch to the brain. Um, in particular, it has a huge role in reorganizing the neural pathways of the prefrontal cortex. And that um, is important in adolescence for a lot of reasons. I mean, like the science is, you know, we don't know a lot about a brain, the brain in general, don't get me wrong. So, you know, we extrapolate a lot, but um, in adolescence, there's a lot of unique phenomena that happen for kids that are really, you know, likely very involved in how humans develop separation from families, the sense of self-identity, and some other things that kind of help from us, it's in a way kind of from a regulatory standpoint. Um, and we're not really sure sort of what that means or what that looks like, but there's something that happens in puberty, I think, for these, these kids that does sort of sh create a shift in that sort of behavioral manifestation and how they kind of present um, a little bit calmer, even though they maybe aren't calmer necessarily. But um, so there's there's something that happens in puberty for all kids, um, but for these boys, maybe something even more unique, kind of similar to, to how people understand the Fragile X community in, in how they um, see themselves in relation to other people. And that, that identity formation during this time is incredibly important because when you think about how humans have evolved, right? Like we evolve, um, in a context of a family, but then there's like a period where it's like super important that you actually start to, to like disengage from your family a bit to kind of gain a sense of like, who am I in relation to my family? And like, what it, who, like, what do I like? And like, what pieces of this for my family that are our values and what I've learned and who I am that I'm going to like preserve? And what are pieces that are like, I don't know if I like that. And I kind of want to like do that different. And that's, you know, kind of, you know, evolved with us as humans humans in the way that that's a period where you are able to do more on your own, where your parents can give that space and you can kind of take those risks socially, right? To kind of feel that out. Well, when you have dependent needs, that's automatically interrupted, right? So how do we think about how do we help navigate puberty and navigate this process? It's super important in a way that helps facilitate a concept of identity formation, sense of self, and, and really working on on that so that when we get to a place that we can separate, disengage and spread our wings that we want to do that and that we, we feel capable 
of doing that in the sense that like I, I want, I do see myself as a separate person than my parents. And I do want to do my own thing a little bit or like have a life outside of just this. Um, you know, if we miss that period, it can be kind of hard, I think, to kind of get get shifted into that um, because there's a lot of skills that go into learning, you know, how to do that, right? Like we've all, all the adults on the call, like you remember going through puberty and um, I don't think any of us would be like, let's do that again, right? Um, so, you know, it's it's a heavy thing. And so I, we're, we are just now like shaving the ice of the iceberg that is what do we do to help adults? Like these are these are just ice shavings, right? And so um, we got a long, we got a long, hard way to go to think about what actually is good care for like helping us navigate developing high quality life in adulthood um, and using these things like adolescence and thinking that, you know, they need to push into that or lean into that, that space of uh, um, identity formation, I think is really important. This is also a time when we start to like really refine those skills need to be a successful adult. If you're not really engaging and going out and, and kind of separating from your family, you're also not learning skills like how to navigate peer conflict, how to, you know, initiate conversation, how to manage rejection, how to, you know, date, how to do all sorts of things. And, you know, there's pain that comes with that, right? And, and that's why you do, you know, hopefully do it when you're young so that you have a soft place to land. And if you mess up, you're not gonna mess up that bad because you're a teen. Um, the stakes are a lot higher in adulthood. And so, you know, when that's missed, like it, you know, you kind of lose your easy opportunities to practice those things once you're out of high school. Um, and, you know, the transition from adolescence to adulthood, like, is it magical, right? Like, it's not like you're all of a sudden 17 and 364 days and then 17 and then you turn 18 and it's like, oh, snap, I have all these skills, right? That's just not how it goes. And so, um, they're really, you know, we just, you know, we, I think we're, we get so focused on, you know, um, helping the boys, you know, be healthy. We sometimes forget that, you know, part of being healthy is being, you know, mentally healthy and, and having a good skill set around doing the things to help us get the things we want in life, um, which you do have to learn to do. And this is where the school setting becomes so important for these kids. And there are kids that are, are homeschooled, don't get me wrong. Um, there are kids who, who have other sort of ways that they, they do school, but by and large, the majority of our kids are in some sort of public education setting. And so um, I don't mean to exclude those, those homeschool kids or anything like that, but that's a little bit of a different situation. But if you're on this call, I'm happy to hear from you because I'd like to know what I'm not knowing. Um, so the formal school setting provides a lot of natural opportunities to cultivate that you just, that like help us that you just don't get after graduation. Because when you lose that environment, you lose access to things like super, you know, uh, easy opportunities for socialization and navigating and developing friends, right? Like there's something to being with the same kids, you know, for 12 years that makes it a little bit easier to kind of like say hi and, and, and develop friendships. There's an incredible structure to schools. And even though they might change classes every year or something like that, like the school structure itself is something that is consistent and it's something that then benefits because each year they kind of go to school, they know that like they adapt better because like they know what to expect and they can navigate that environment successfully. And so there's a lot of ways that we can then impact that schedule to help them function their best um, in a way that kind of takes that demand off them, like schedule breaks and modifying how their courses are laid out and what courses go where and X, Y, Z, all the things we do for our, our little biddies. Um, that kind of goes away. And that routine is really helpful for these kids from a coping standpoint, because our brain, right, is a really good, it's really good at keeping us safe. And if you're heightened all the time, right, your brain has been predictive mode. And so it's going to predict like, this is what's going to happen. This is going to happen next. And when that's right, your brain's like, cool, this makes sense. I don't need to be freaking out. But when it's wrong, right, for any of us, we're like, I don't like that. But for these boys, it's like swing, swing city. And so once you lose that routine, even though it might just be you're hanging at home, you know, chilling all day, anything unexpected at that point is going to impact you, right? And so it is better to have a routine, even if it's, you know, busier, right? Because then you're at least you're in that predictive and your brain knows what to expect. And there isn't sort of that like zero to hundred always happening, right? Versus kind of like a steady 30. Um, and then you lose sort of, you know, all of all the things that inquired to go to school 
uh, like you gotta get up, you gotta get ready. You gotta go to brush your teeth. You gotta eat. You gotta go be around people. Like all of those things are natural buffers to sort of behavioral inactivation um, induced depression that we can see once people like aren't able to do as much or um, any of us, like I challenge you, I don't do this, but like, if you just stayed home and like laid in bed for two weeks, you would start to feel really depressed. Um, not because anything's happening in life or not because anything, but just because like, if you don't do anything and you can't, you don't move, it naturally impacts your mood. Well, when you have a muscle disease and you can't move super well and do those things, right. There's, there's a, that's a natural vulnerability. And so school helps put a kind of buffer, buffer that a bit in that it does help kind of you be active. You know, um, it's nice because you got to go to school because it's the law. So it's really easy as a parent to be like, buddy, I don't care that you don't want to go, right? Like, I'm not going to jail. You're not going to jail. You're going to school, right? And it's a little bit easier to manage because it is what it is. And like, you know, it's, it, you can, it's kind of easier to push in the place of distress when, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Um, it also creates natural parameters that you have to function in. And so like, you might get called on in class. You're going to have to respond. Um, you, you know, like kids are going to be walking around you. We have to learn how to manage your anxiety. It puts you in positions that you have to navigate um, and you can't really avoid super easily. And so that's a really helpful parameter for these guys um, because it does kind of put them in situations that um, otherwise they would be, have a high propensity to avoid. There's standardized experiences across cohorts. So like there's a benefit of going to school as a group of kids that you kind of go to school with as you age. Um, and things for things like starting to talk about the transition from elementary school to middle school, right? Like that is very inclusive. Like that's experience everybody shares. It's anxiety provoking. Same with graduating from high school. It's an experience everyone shares, right? Like you could have DMD or you could have spinal cord injury or you could have diabetes or you could, you know, be neurotypical, super healthy, whatever it's still stressful to graduate from high school and go on to the next stage. Like that's a shared experience. So, and that's commonly addressed in schools. Awesome. What's not addressed is the layer that it's more stressful when you have dystronopathy because there's a lot of unknowns, right? Like, well, if I want to go to school, how's that going to look? Or if I want to get a job, how's that going to look? Who would go with me? Like my parents can't quit their jobs. Like, and that spirals, like who helps with that? Is that the school's job? Is that your parents' job? Is that your neuromuscular clinic's job? Is that your job? Like whose job is that? And that's like, you know, in the school setting, like, not trying to be rude, you know, they're not trying to be mean, but they're not thinking about that, right? Like, they don't know, like, they're all walking around with their healthy muscles. They're not thinking like, what's going on? How do I help this one kid in my school of 700 that has, you know, so it's layered. And so then you're kind of like, well, like, what about me? Like, yeah, this is stressful for y'all. But like, I also then need help getting out of bed so I can go to my college classes. Like, that's a whole other level of stress, right? And then you might be away from home for the first time. Actually, so it's just, as everyone is, right, but different level of vulnerability. And so preparing for that likely takes additional steps and time and maybe some sort of therapeutic interventions to prepare for that to be successful. Otherwise, the propensity is like, I'm not doing that thing. It sounds too scary. Not because I can't, not because I'm not smart enough, not because I'm not capable, but because like, I don't, I wouldn't even know how to start doing that. So like, no, thank you. Right. On top of all the six hours of it takes for me to like do my care a day. I'm going to start like doing that. Like it's, you know, like you, there's a feasibility thing here. The elephants in this room is that everybody that's helping you also has never navigated the transition to adulthood, having a dystrophy, right? So everyone's operating in the dark. And so it's like the blind lean the blind. We're like, oh, this is what we think is a good idea, right? Like, we don't know. I don't know. I don't know if you guys know. We can definitely make educated guesses and we're trying. Right. But, you know, this is really, you know, we're in the, the wild, wild west with regards to having men living much longer in much healthier ways who have real desires to like live life, not just be alive, but live life, which is very different. And so, like, you know, now I think there's a bit of scrambling, honestly, in the community around well, like, well, like, well, what do we do to be helpful? You know, because this infrastructure is not there. Um, great. Like if you want to, you know, it's, you know, there are people that love and can go to day programs and they work really well, but after, other than that, after high school, it, like your options are super limited and, and that's just horrific really when, when you think about it, representation matters and it's important. Who is the model? Who are our models in this community of, of the men going to college or going to grad school? I can, I can name a handful of men that I know of 
PhDs or advanced degrees or college degrees off the top of my head, but do you know who they are? Do you guys get to talk to them? Do you talk to each other? How do you, you know, you know, we have role models and we have heroes and, you know, in the media and community and, you know, or older kids in school or whatever it is. And we don't, we don't have that platform yet built in this community for how do we link and have models and access their models and the people that have done this that can help us kind of like, you know, navigate these line, man, man, landmines. I don't know where they are. I just know there's landmines and, you know, we want to do our best. Right. And so I think probably in the next several years, we'll have more of these role models. Right. And unfortunately the, the people that will be these role models are the, are the dudes that are like, you know, figuring it out right now. And like we are. And so uh, that's not a fun place to be when you're kind of like, oh yeah, like I did all this and yeah, don't do that. That did not work. Um, but that's kind of where we are to a degree, which is, you know, unfortunate, but it is, that is an elephant that like, it's not an easy process and we're figuring out and we might be wrong. So we might be like, this is a good idea. Let's do this thing. And it might not be a good idea. And really the primary focus prior to adulthood and prior to like probably the last several years has been on improving muscle function and, you know, some trying to have people live as long as possible. And, and we're doing that. And now that's novel. And now we're like, okay, but like now what? Living, living to do what? And I think, you know, when I talk to adults and I, you know, I, I see a lot of adults for therapy and a lot of the things that are cause angst and cause mental health symptoms are things that are um, valid. Right. And, and it's, you know, my job, I can, I'm not going to train you to cope and be okay with things that aren't okay. That's not helpful. Um, we might have to cope with distress related to things that just are not things we like and we want to change, but, but in a lot of ways, like it, it just sucks. And, and that's the reality in a lot of ways is that like, it just feels bad to, to be, alive and to want to do these things and to not be able to access them easily or to not have the resources available to help you access them, right? Like if you want to go to college and you don't have, you know, you're not rich or you don't have family who can kind of do that, you might not be able to care aid. You might not be able to go to college you want, or maybe one of your parents can have to quit their jobs if they can, so that somebody can go with you to attend class. Um, you know, like that's, that's not a good, that's not a good platform. Of, of support to help people be successful in, in that setting. Um, but that's where we're at, because all the families, you guys are all like, we gotta figure this out. Like all my kids, you know, we, we did all these things. So you, you would live to be older and now you're older and we gotta like, what do you wanna do with your life, right? And so then parents are like, oh man, like I feel really bad about this because like, I don't, I can't just not work, right? And like, so that's a huge stressor for families. Um, and you know, we can have all the resources in the world, right? But like at the end of the day, like even our, you know, physical disability resources are not designed and well thought out for people who can't move that well and need help moving. So cool, you have an electric door thing, but like, I can't hit that. How am I going to get inside? Mm -hmm. Right. So again, helpful. Great. Awesome. Glad we have that. I don't have to like touch door handles anymore. Big fan. Um, but that's probably helping me more than helping you. And that's, you know, that kind of defeats the purpose of those types of things. And, and so when we think about disability inclus inclusivity, not just getting into the building, but then are there people in the building that are trained and able to help you do the things, right? Um, are there tools? Are there adaptive technology? All that kind of stuff um, is really important. And then we start to think about adulthood and our stressors kind of start to change, right? And we start to have um, a different relationship with ourselves because we're spending a lot more time kind of with ourselves and other things. Um, and we're dealing a lot with things like anxiety, all sorts of anxiety, not just generalized anxiety and the OCD, but we have a lot more social anxiety because like any of you might know, the more that you don't do with other people, the harder it is to. So if any of you kind of, I kind of withdrew into yourselves during the pandemic, like, which I'm sure we all did, I did. I'm a very social extroverted person and I barely hang out with people anymore. I imagine you're in the same position. And then you think about going back to do that and you're like, ah, oh, it kind of like makes me anxious. Like, are you guys like healthy? Like, I don't know, like what's going on. And so that's a real risk. And so for other people, I could say like, you're being really anxious. You need to get back out there, bro. But for when you have a neuromuscular condition that packs your rest rate, it's like, 
yikes. Like, yeah, you got to get back out there. And like, I don't know if that's a safe decision. So then what are, what are we balancing? What's more important, mental health or keeping our body safe? Um, and you start to see things, maybe more like more panic attacks, maybe that those social phobias, sort of low mood depression. Um, current, like current, like I miss my friends. All my friends are in college or they've taken these different life pathways. I miss, you know, doing stuff. All I do is, you know, X, Y, Z now. And also about the future, like, you know, what does the future hold for me? Like that can, that can cause a lot of distress. We still see those concerns for ADHD and, you know, low frustration tolerance or being particular. I mean, the, I always talk about socks because that's a big one for the, the males, the adults um, about their socks. Um, and my parents will be like, I need to go to work and we're trying to rearrange socks for three hours. So there's no way we can go to college because nobody can do that. Um, and that should not be a barrier to going to college because we can't get our socks comfy. Willingness and social isolation becomes huge. Um, and so loneliness by definition is the perceived state of having few meaningful social relationships. So you could not necessarily, you could have a ton of people around you, but if you perceive yourself to not have very meaningful, robust sort of connections, then you're going to feel lonely, okay? So it's not really about other people, it's about your perception. And that can be hard, it's a subject, subjective state. Whereas social isolation is where you do have just a low number of meaningful social contact. So in the midst of a pandemic, everybody was socially isolated, right? Um, our boys are, and men are really like, they're really engaged in that online community. And so they were probably more buffered than a lot of us in their mental health during the pandemic because of how their world is naturally structured. Um, so, you know, thinking of solitude, which is choosing to be alone, which is fine. There are people that choose to be alone. However, when we are choosing solitude because not because like we don't like people and we, you know, but because like we get anxious and X, Y, Z. So we only want that online because it feels better. That may not always be in our best interest because we maybe really want more, you know, physical proximity in our, in our relationships that might actually make us happier. So we might not be getting the fulfillment out of those online relationships as we want. And so it doesn't always, it doesn't always maybe help as much as it could, but it's still, you know, helpful, right? But there are guys that that have that sort of mismatch and kind of what they need and, and sort of what they're willing to do. And then we start to have, you know, the issues of like acute and more chronic pain and discomfort um, just because of, of, of how we can, having weaker muscles feels in over time. Um, and, and that's really important because pain and pain is huge impact on mental health and sleep and all sorts of things. And these demands and stressors are additive and they start to have a bigger impact on mental health functioning adults because the natural supports like high school are gone and those distractors. So it might, you might feel a type of way and you're like, yeah, like I kind of feel I'm a, you know, I'm a little uncomfortable. I have some back pain today. You know, I'm tired and you go to school and you look see your friends and you get distracted and you just kind of don't pay attention to it as much, right? It's still there. It's just not, it's not as loud, right? It kind of moves back here. Well, if you're home doing nothing, it's that real hard to shift back here, right? And so you kind of lose the things that naturally help. So like you didn't even know, you didn't know that you needed to develop a skill set around that because you kind of had these other things that were just naturally happening that let you kind of function better. There's a so much distress that starts to develop for these young men when they are older and their uh, mental, their, their frontal lobes are more developed and they start to really start to take stock of what it means to, to care for them. And I have not had a single male that I have met as an adult who has not processed tremendous amount of distress and guilt and fear about their parents. My parents are aging. They're not going to take care of me forever. My parents, like, I, like it's hard on their bodies. Like they don't get to do the things they want to do. Like they feel bad, right? Like the impact on your life and they carry that. And I think in some ways, like some of the men I think are, are much more prone to doing things that they think is helpful to their parents um, by reducing demands because they feel bad. And so, you know, they, they don't speak up and they don't say things and they wouldn't want to add more to your plate because they already feel like you sacrificed so much for them. Um, and that's how they see it. Like, I'm a burden, they're sacrificing for me. That's not how you all see it, but this is what they carry.
and there's a lot of stress to like finding purpose and wanting your own livelihood and your own self-sufficiency and wanting to like do and and to like you know care for yourself and and to do that and and not 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 to be able to do that but to want to do that is a special sort of place to help right because if you don't want to do that and you can't do it it's like okay right but if you really want that and and it's just hard to access like that's very distressing because now like everything that other people are doing for you kind of feels bad right because you would really prefer to be doing that for them or to be you know kind of contributing um and so there's a lot of existential stress and distress that starts to happen in the adulthood period simply because they're a thinking at a higher level and able to kind of take stock of like what it actually means to be kind of an adult like caring for somebody um finding mental health providers that that are understanding or um kind of open to thinking different can be challenging. I mean, it's hard um, mostly because like a lot of the men don't even know what they don't know about their own brain. So when they meet, have a provider, if they're seeking their own care and you're trying to explain like, you know, the uniqueness that is dystronopathy and, and you don't really know how to do that. It's going to be hard sometimes to help your therapist understand like why this is harder for you than like maybe other people they've helped deal with a similar issue or what seems like a similar issue. And when it comes to sort of like, how do we, how do we then navigate sort of workplaces or academic supports? Um, if that's not done in high school, it's really hard, almost impossible to kind of do that later in life. And so for our, our boys and men who are really high functioning and maybe like kind of flew under the radar for other things they weren't as good at, but like likely maybe huge needs around that could be really helpful in like a workplace setting to get started young. We don't want to miss out on that, right? Because if you have an IEP or something in high school that sort of like, um, you know, has like more time for stuff and, and X, Y, Z, like that can be incorporated into a workplace because it's um, the law. And, but you have to get that started early. And so sometimes you know, being a little bit more thoughtful, younger about like what sort of things we might not actually need right now, but probably will need down the road can be helpful to think about incorporating into like the supports, even if we don't use them as much as maybe we, we might need to later, because we want to be able to like build off of that. If you don't ever contact anyone except your, your safety bubble, um, and you're not put in situations that maybe are, you know, not preferred, you might not actually know that you're not functioning super great. Um, uh, you might also, you might also like the type of functioning might actually really work for you, or it might work for your family, but not you, or it might not work for, your, for you, but it works for your family. Um, any of those is, is kind of a problem because it, it does take, you know, help to kind of change these things. And so, um, it's, I think, common for people to feel like they're doing a lot better than they would, maybe if they were in a situation where other people were giving them feedback. It's really hard to find providers right now for anybody. Um, it's even harder to find providers that have a sense of dystronopathy, and there's just really long wait lists. And so when you do want help, it can be really hard to find it. And, and when you're already kind of at a disadvantage because you know you have a complex medical condition, um, you know, you know, that, that puts you at even more of a disadvantage of finding a therapist um, because, you know, therapists can choose like, oh, I, that, that sounds maybe outside of my scope of practice, right? Um, it's not probably, but, you know, it sounds like it is. And so that, that's a huge, that's a huge reality of, of right now. It's hard to understand and support mental health for anybody. Um, even harder, right? Because the people that are helping you all are, are people like me. Um, not people with dystronopathy who are also then psychologists and professionals and who are like, oh yeah, you guys like love what you're saying, but you are just so wrong here. Or, you know, to have the insights about like actually a good idea, but it needs to go like this. And so the people driving this bus right now are like people with blinders on and, you know, we're being like, I think we're on a road, right? Like we're kind of on a road. And what we need is like somebody else in that driver's seat that's like knows the road that we're on. Um, and so, you know, Again, though, that will take a little bit of time to, to, to get, get these young men trained into these professional roles, right? Um, but unless you have a seat at the table and are, are kind of directing this, then other people are making decisions for you, unfortunately. And that's where we've been um, because we're just kind of new into the adult world of, of DMD.
anxiety does not necessarily mean there is a genuine threat. That's like literally the definition of anxiety. Like I feel there's threat and there's not really a necessarily a threat. So my body's biological system is for some reason activating when it shouldn't. It's an inappropriate response. But having dyssernopathy is a genuine threat. Although not all the anxiety that you experience is related to your underlying DBMD, right? But managing anxiety means battling the process of your brain and body telling you something's wrong when it isn't. But there is. So it's this unique position of, you know, we might have anxiety about the power going out during a storm. Well, if you didn't have dystronopathy, that is not a real threat, right? It's like, okay, yeah, it might be dark. It might be scary. You might lose your refrigerator. It's super inconvenient. Um, but the anxiety around that for somebody with dystronopathy and maybe with some advanced needs like vent support or cough assist or power wheelchair or something like that is a real threat. And so part of managing anxiety for these men and boys, to be honest, is managing the context of a genuine threat. And so we're, our goals are not to get rid of these feelings or to, to kind of train you not to feel them because like we would for like me, um, because it is a genuine threat. And so we have to be mindful of that. We have to, we have to make sure we're, you know, do we have a backup generator? Are we, you know, do we have people we trust that know like to check on me during a storm and this is my pr plan and X, Y, Z. Um, because I have to kind of cope and like the ways I do that is like I have, you know, the steps that I do to make sure that I'm as safe as possible in this context and I kind of work that plan is just very different than it would be for other people. Low mood and sadness doesn't mean you're depressed. It is often a normative response. Like if you're sad, like a little bit during the day or a couple days every, like even every week, but even, a, you know, a couple days every couple weeks or a couple hours a week, that's not pathological that's normal. Not ideal, right? But it's not necessarily pathological. Um, and it's, a, it's something we will predict happens as you are able to move less and to do less easily. Because like I said, natural sort of human response to not being able to move or to being inactive is to your, for your mood to reduce. And so the part of it is like, that's a canary in the coal mine of like, uh, I've not been able to move maybe for years. And this is the first time I'm really feeling down. And the biggest difference is that, you know, X is gone or Y is gone, or this is the biggest change in, in here. And that in and of itself might be what we're considering as an inactivity because it's a significant change in routine. Not because you're like ambulating at 19 and now you're not at 20. Like I'm not, like I'd be like, that's awesome. But I'm, you know, I live in this community with you all. And so like, that's not new. That was in high school too. So the bigger differences are that the activities of, scheduling and all of the things that go into living life, not necessarily just movement. And it's going to happen if you don't take steps to prevent it. So, you know, when we have low mood in adulthood um, and we're just staying at home and just playing video games, which big fan, like do what you want to do for fun. But if that's all we do, right, like you are likely going to have some mood impact just because like you're, you went from getting out of the house every day and having a schedule and doing X and doing Y to, to doing almost nothing. Not that you're not doing something that you like, but even if you're liking and having fun, that can still impact your mood. Like some people love to sleep, but if you sleep all the time, you don't do anything, your mood's going to take a hit. Um, so the ways that we manage these mental health stressors, right, is that we can intervene on thoughts, right? So we can say, you know, my feelings are really bad and I'm not doing the things I want. I, and I'm going to start to challenge and I'm going to change my thoughts as a means of helping myself engage in different behaviors and feelings. Or we might say, you know what? I just feel super crummy and I'm not really having a lot of thoughts. I just feel bad Then I might just do a behavior intervention and I'm just going to get myself doing right. Cause I know that if I'm doing my thoughts and my emotions are going to follow. So we can intervene on one or two to help another. Right. But sometimes like when you talk to your mental health providers in clinic or wherever, and they're bringing things up like this, it's because we see it as an opportunity for you to do one thing in one of these areas and hopefully help all of the areas. And so what this might look like, right, is like, so if we have, if we're thinking of cognitive strategies, so if we're really stuck in our thoughts of, um, you know, uh, maybe fear thoughts or anxiety thoughts, and, and they're really kind of getting in our way of doing something. So like, if we're really nervous that we're going to get dropped out of our lift. And so we kind of have a lot of delays in our transfers. And so like, every morning, mom and dad are kind of like, yeah, it's going to take a while because they're just like, wait, 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 wait
And then you're like, okay. And then you like, you kind of go through it. You get comfortable and you're like, wait, 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 wait. And you kind of go through this process, right? And we're like, oh, let's change this. So we start to think, well, I'm, maybe it's my thoughts. Let's start there, right? Because like we do this every day. And if, if it was just behavior, then we just begin better. Well, maybe we need to identify a situation. So I'm getting lifted and that feels weird, right? And I don't have a lot of control. So naturally it makes me uncomfortable. Super fair. I'm glad your biological systems are working. Pat them on the back. Say, thank you, body, for doing this job. Identify the unhelpful thought, though, which is, what if I get dropped? Right? And we identify replacement thought. And this is where it, the work comes in. Because what we have to say is, what's a good replacement thought? Well, have you ever been dropped? Probably not. So I have now X, Y, Z age, and I've never been dropped. So statistically, the likelihood of that happening is, is this. And so I need to thank my body for doing its job, but I need to tell it that that's an illogical fear. And I'm just got to keep going over that process, right? So this is this, and this is what I'm replacing it with. And I work that process. And you have to notice then like how that changes my feelings over time, right? Do you notice that it starts to get easier to do that lift quicker, right? And then you might say, you know what? I'm going to actually talk to my mom or my dad or my caregiver or my aide. And I'm going to say, I'm working on changing this. So I'm going to be doing this. And when I say, wait, 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 I want you to just go. Like, I don't want you to stop. I want you to be like, yeah, you're fine, buddy. Here we go. Because I need to not have that stop because that actually reinforces my anxiety unintentionally, right? And that's where we can make some of these changes. And that's that thoughts, feelings, behavior, and why we kind of think about targeting all three. This then also helps us promote what we have been talking about with behavioral activation and planning. And one of the best ways to think about how do I get active again is to start thinking of an activity schedule. Well, how do I build activities into my schedule that I am committed to doing and that I'm going to adhere to doing? And it might be things like certain times that you game with certain groups, right? And you adhere to that, like no matter if you're tired or whatever, because there's something to being a human, to setting goals and doing them and kind of working that, that just helps you feel better. But we also have to pace, right? So we don't want to be like, on Mondays, I do all the things and then I rest for five days, right? Because I'm tired. So that's the other thing is that, not only does it help kind of get you active, but it helps with pacing. And you want to start to identify too, because you might notice like, actually, if I do too much, I don't actually feel better, right? And so behavior activation is important and it might have to look different than it does for maybe somebody that's ambulatory, but the concept isn't different. The function isn't different. And use that exposure advantage. Like if you're, you know, use the lifts, use the things you have to do as, as periods to work on helping your body restructure that, right? So we don't engage in a lot of comfort chasing. We don't engage in a lot of reassurance seeking, right? So we set a limit for how long we're going to mess with our socks. We set a 20 minute limit and we say, you know, like, I don't like it, but I know they're going to walk away and they're going to check back in an hour. And if I need an adjustment, they're going to do it. And I know I'm not going to die because my socks are uncomfortable. And lo and behold, that hour comes around and nobody is thinking about their socks, right? And so like, we have to, we have to commit to doing the things that we know will help ourselves over time, which is hard, right? Um, but I'll tell you now, if, if rearranging the socks for four hours worked, you all won't be doing it, but it doesn't work. So, and then we start to think about the stressors just associated with having, you know, being, having physical and functional needs. The responsibility is now yours on you to, to, to manage your own care once you're 18. So that 17, 364, you're like, I am an, I am a neonate and I don't know anything about anything about my medical care. And then the next day, everybody's like, okay, so what do you want to do? And you're like, do about what? I don't know. Ask my mom. And they're like, can't ask your mom. Um, but the, but as an individual, the responsibility is yours, but you literally can't do anything without someone's help. So like, what a mind trip that is. It's like, Hey, all of the responsibility is yours. You have to do all the things, see all the things but, er, but not really. Cause somebody else has got to help you do all the things. Like you can't even sign your name sometimes. Right. So then it's like, well, that doesn't feel like I have a lot of autonomy. Right. There's time commitments to care schedules, right? Is it possible to go to school and have a full-time job in a traditional manner? I don't, I don't know. I, there are guys that do it and there are a lot of guys who want to and they can't figure out how to do it. Caregiver schedule might not be congruent with, with what you want to do. And then that just, that just feels really bad. And, um, you know, I hope we find ways that to manage these things different and to maybe think about how do we get resources to people who maybe need them more so that that people can be successful in, in kind of getting to that next stage of, of adulting. Um, but it's hard. And, and, you know, I don't want to villainize parents for being like, you need to sacrifice everything so you can go to college. Like, 
that's thrown the baby off the bathwater in a lot of ways. And so, you know, it's, it's just a really, it's a rock and hard place in a lot of times for families and, and not because they want their kids, you know, and then people like me sit on their high horse and they're like, I think that we infantilize and these boys just stay home with their parents and they need to get out to college. And it's like, okay, well, you're going to go to college with them and take care of them because like I had to work. And I think that's a real, that's a real thing. And, and it's like, yeah, like all these things are needed. Everything I'm talking about is needed, but it's not an easy pathway to, to get there. And there's a huge impact on pain and mental health functioning. And if you're uncomfortable and you're, and you know, whether that's a bracing need or, or a scoliosis or because you're contractured or just because gravity, um, it's really hard to focus and it can be really hard to, to, to want to do things. And you can just make you feel really miserable. And, and um, that is a part of potentially disease progression for a lot of individuals and might really lend itself for things like, you know, chronic pain treatment and, and having psychologists that maybe more specifically start to think about that in this community. And um, yeah, it's, that's something I am feeling strongly about right now. And then working with some colleagues here about uh, who are some of my, my pain experts and on how do we think about kind of preparing folks to, to navigate chronic pain that we know will likely develop before it happens. There's a huge shift in the hierarchy in medical cares as you get older. Um, the neuromuscular physician might not be the most popular or most important provider anymore. Um, and that's really different. And so like, if you're, you know, and these boys are routine. So, you know, they might be like, I need to see Dr. So-and-so. And like, that's, that's some, that's the thing. I just need to see them. And it's like, you know, how do we start to have conversations? Like their abilities to help you are, are kind of done. And now these other people are kind of taking over and you maybe don't have as much faith or you don't know them as well or X, Y, Z. And um, we start to meet new people like psychology and palliative care. And, and that's scary. Like, what does that mean? And you might transfer to adult center and that, that can be just real night and day. Um, you know, it feels sometimes feels very different to get your care in an adult center than it does a pediatric center. Um, and then you have to build trust with a new team after you've, you know, maybe been going to one team for 20 years or 18 years and you know them and they know you and you know the center. And now you're going into this adult world where they don't even talk to your parents and they don't know all the things about DMD and you and they're expecting you to answer and they're making you look at them in the eyes. And if they would just like let you look away and talk to them and not be rude to you about that, then you would probably be able to engage with them, but they don't know that. Right. And that's a whole bunch of learning curve to navigate when you're kind of maybe not in your best self state because you've kind of lost all these natural buffers and supports. It is the people in your life's responsibility to prepare you to do this, right? Um, but it's not easy. Helping develop medical literacy is challenging. I mean, for anybody in the population, we have a lot of people without dystronopathies who don't know anything about, about their own health and, and what's needed. Uh, talking with medical providers and navigating medical visits and, and sometimes the egos associated with that is a skill set. And, and these boys tend to shut down. And if they don't have that kind of ability to, to do that and, to, and tolerate that distress and navigate that, it's, it's hard then in the adult world for that to go successful. Um, and it can kind of result in some less than ideal things happening um, just because there's not good communication. There's a skill set in coaching others how to take care of you. Um, you know, if you've never practiced getting detailed instructions on step by step how you like your socks put on, and your mom just knows how to do it, so your mom just does it, that's not necessarily setting you up for success as an adult, right? Because you might be really rude or mean to people because you're like, gosh, you just know how to do it. Like my mom just does it, and you're like, okay, well, I'm not your mom, calm down. Um, and they find themselves like nobody owes you anything, right? Like people are going to get, they're not going to want to help you if you're mean to them just because you're frustrated. And so like, there's a skill set to helping somebody know how to do something exactly how you want it done. Right. And that's a weakness for these boys anyways, because their language development is often a deficit. And so then we're like, Hey, you have to be super good at this thing. You're kind of bad at in order for it to go really well. Like you're cool with that. Right. Um, and so like, that's really important to start young. So even with you as parents, right. Like, you know, making them start to do that with you, even though they'll be frustrated is like, a helpful thing to start to do. And then hiring in-home caregivers, right? So when I talk to the men about things, which we'll talk about here in a bit, but like dating is an easy one. They're like, I don't want my mom to go on dates with me or my dad to go on dates with me. I'm like, well, let's talk about hiring caregivers. And they're like, I don't know how to do that, right? Well, 
no, of course you don't. You've never done it. I don't know how to hire caregivers either. I've never hired a caregiver, but like, we'll try to figure it out. But that's interviewing. And then that becomes you like a manager of people. And like, you might have to give them difficult feedback. You might have to fire them. Like, how do you feel about that? And like helping them see like that, like as sort of a source of agency. And like, that's a skill set that like you guys probably don't have, right? Like you've been the caregiver. So, you know, you know, unless you're a manager and you've done a lot of hiring, but there's, you know, how do you look for a good fit? What kind of questions do you ask? Like, how do you kind of like test some things out, right? Like those are all kind of skills that are important to learn that if you don't learn, like, I mean, you're going to be really anxious about doing something, like trying to get an in-home caregiver. And it's often just easier to maintain the status quo, right? Like families are like, I, like, I don't have the bandwidth to do all the things I'm already doing. And then to also add on the demands of like taking the additional hour it's going to take us to do this for you to describe it to me in detail to make sure I'm, you're learning this skill. I get that, right? Um, and that's a tough place to be because sometimes it is like, it, how do we do this in a way that is efficient and doesn't add on, you know, four hours onto our care schedule day. Um, the best ways to manage are to get involved in medical visits and decision making as early as possible so that you're developing that skill set, cultivating it, getting feedback and like kind of working on like how, how's the best way to do that for you, right? It might be preparing before you come to a visit or it might be making a list or it might be, you know, doing that and then bringing somebody that you feel is a more eloquent speaker, but like you've been involved with that beforehand. There's a lot of ways to do it, um, but figuring that out for yourself, I think is an important part of being an adult. You have to practice advocating for accommodations because you might be in a workplace by yourself at some point and you need to be able to advocate verbally um, through writing, through dictating, through however, and what you need to be successful in that setting um, because that's your legal right, but it's also your responsibility to ensure that you know, it's happening and that it's in place so that you are, you know, as successful as possible. And then again, you know, practicing that coaching. Um, and then we, you start to think about the stressors related to social connectedness and friendships and non-familial intimate relationships are, are desired by most, but really difficult to obtain after high school because it's like social isolation for a lot of the men. And it's, sometimes it's just because you have to be willing to, to meet people to form new relationships, which means you have to be comfortable kind of going out, being in the community and actively like in initiating conversations and then sustaining that in some meaningful follow-up way, right? To kind of keep that going, but that makes you more at risk from communicable diseases, respiratory illnesses, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of vulnerability into kind of being, you know, social with strangers in public when you can't kind of physically keep yourself safe. There's a lot of, you know, stressors with that. Um, and if, if that's not something you want to do, then you have to kind of be willing to do that online to kind of have a social community, which is a little bit easier for some of the dudes. But then it doesn't allow for that physicality or physical proximity of relationships and being with people, which there is something to. It feels different when you're socializing with somebody online than it does when you're in person with them. And then there's also the shift that kind of often needs to occur or, or, or does occur naturally, or um, if it doesn't, can be a problem. Um, but it's also, you know, not a shift that every, that is a value for every family. Like, and they see that parents and kids can, can maybe be friends or have an adult friendship. That's not something that all families feels a thing that they want to do. And, and that's totally fine. Um, but it is a variable to consider when, thinking about, you know, yourself as parent, yourself as caregiver, yourself as nurse, yourself as aide, yourself as friend, if, if you are kind of, you know, one of the only people in, in your son's life, um, that's a lot of different types of relationships and, and why not add a more of a friendship piece into that mix if you're already doing all the things um, as so that some of these things can happen a little bit, you know, maybe more easily for the, for the guys and that maybe, you know, nobody wants to go out with their mom, but maybe going out with their wingman would be okay, right? And, and having, being able to kind of maybe think about shifting your relationship a little bit um, in some ways anyway. Uh, you need people to be with you to socialize, um, but that doesn't mean the people that can come with you are who you want with you. And there are times that friends are willing to do that, but that's a skill set too. How do I talk with my friends? what sort of social skills and like, what are my strengths and how do I pull that in to, to make this go as least awkward and as best as possible, right? Do I use humor? Do I kind of like, you know, take a different approach? How do I, how do I, you know, do this in a way that, that makes me comfortable and makes them comfortable? 
Um, and there might be some social skills training needed. Um, like I, I work with a dude, he's really funny, has a great sense of humor and, and his friends are more than willing to help him. And we talk about that. And we talk about how to use humor, you know, when they, when they maybe make jokes because they're uncomfortable, like how do we respond to that humor to diffuse a situation, right? Um, and, you know, that, ta- you know, bringing the elephant to the room, which is like, I might need help eating. I might need help, like moving my chair, right? I might need you to open a door for me. And that's not something you have to think about for our other friends, right? But, you know, helping that coaching and letting them know, like, that's, that's an important piece of that. And, you know, most friend groups are really, are really open to doing that once they know, right? But, you know, they also don't assume because people are kind of told, like, you know, you don't just like assume people can't do things for themselves, right? If they, even if they look like they have a disability. And so that ownership shouldn't be on your, on you and that burden shouldn't be yours to carry as somebody with, with um, a physical disability. Um, but leaning into that and, and taking that burden and being like, I'm going to bring this in and I'm going to teach you guys how to navigate this thing that makes you uncomfortable can be really helpful. And then, you know, in high school and, and, in a young adulthood, a lot of men maybe haven't had a lot of opportunities to date or to talk about or to learn about or to have sort of sexual experiences or intimate experiences that were meaningful. And so they may not even know what questions they want to ask or how to ask questions to trusted adults or other people in their lives about things that they're curious about or about experiences they would like to have or they're interested in. And they might not have a peer group to also kind of provide guidance or at least not a peer group that like gets what it feels like to have D&D. And so again, like who are our models and how are we helping guide um, normal parts of being a human that have not been addressed in this community because we've been focusing on preserving muscle health. Um, but, you know, as an adult male, you might want to date, you know, you might want to find a girlfriend or a boyfriend or, you know, whatever you're into. And, and knowing how to navigate those dynamics is really important. And so, helping and thinking about intentionally, not just things you like, like not just gaming all the time, right? Or not just reading all the time or not just watching movies, but thinking of what other hobbies or interests would I maybe be willing to do or have interest in as sort of a way to cultivate like ways to meet people in real life and actually form connections and form like kind of groups of people that feel like you can hang with. Um, And you might need to start small and kind of build from there and things like volunteering or, um, tutoring or other things that you kind of can, can use your skill sets and to sort of help kind of be, bring yourself into a community can be really helpful. And thinking of that sort of young and using opportunities, like you might not want to do certain things in high school, but it might be a really good opportunity to kind of like generate some interest and you don't hate it, but it's not your favorite thing, right? Like that's okay. It's okay to have interests like that, that you don't do all the time, but that like serve a secondary function, right? Um, you know, like some people play sports to work out because they hate working out. So like they like sports and getting exercise is a secondary function of that, right? Like you might like playing video games, but like, let's try board games and like get in a board game club. And like that creates some in-person socialization opportunities. And it kind of replicates something I already enjoy, maybe not the same way, right? But I can play D&D you know, and I can do that with a group of people and you can do that online, right? And that lets you form those communities. And so thinking of ways to kind of, you know, broaden your horizons, right? Like a um, improv class, there's, oh, there's so many things that you can do that aren't just gaming that provide opportunities to meet people into adulthood, um, but it's scary and you have to kind of get creative and you have to be thoughtful. And then once you start to do this and you're scheduling activities outside of your home and stuff, you have to stick to it. So if you're committing, you're like, I'm going to do this thing. That's where that is really important because your brain's going to be like, I don't know. I don't know if I want to do this. I feel anxious. And you have to say like, I'm not listening to you right now because this thing is important to me. So I'm still going to do it. And that, that can be hard. And then we start to think about the future. And you really need to understand your disease process and how disease progression occurs in order to plan for the future. And that's not necessarily... You know, nobody's being like, you know what? I can't wait to talk about DMD progression today. This is going to be super fun. I just really want to start to get off on the right foot. Um, it's not, it's not, they're not fun conversations and things that aren't easy to talk about that make us uncomfortable are easy to avoid. Like who will serve as your caregiver? Do you, is it old, older siblings? Is it your parents? Is it a care center? Is it an aunt, uncle? What, what's the plan? What's the financial sort of load of that, right? 
do we have the means? Is that part of how we need to plan? Like, what are we going to do to afford these things that we want maybe down the road that we might need? Um, and then we start to talk about things like advanced care directors, right? And discussing goals of care as it relates to disease process and end of life decision making. Um, and that's, you know, nobody's, nobody's favorite thing to do. Um, it's an important thing to do though. Um, because with greater longevity comes the need to have a plan when, for when your parents may not be able to care for you, right? If we're living much, much longer and into our 30s, 40s and 50s and 60s, right? Like it's unlikely when you're, you know, in those older, older years that your parents are gonna be able to do the things. Um, and, and so, you know, having, having some frank and honest conversations about that I, will help kind of alleviate our distress or at least know that we're, we're thinking about planning and that kind of stuff. Um, talking about death and dying is hard and it's difficult and it makes you uncomfortable and it makes other people uncomfortable. So it's easy to avoid, um, but that doesn't make it helpful to avoid. And so conversations as early as you can to start them and to normalize them within your family structure is helpful, regardless of health status, right? And so, you know, have the conversations often, everyone in the family is included. It's not because we have BMD, it's because we're human. Um, I, you know, my parents are, were our healthcare providers and growing up, like we had this conversation once a year. And I, every time I go home to see my parents, like they pull out they're they're like, okay, and this is what we're doing. You know, if this happens, I'm like, yes, I know I have copies. Um, I don't want to always talk about this with you guys, but we do. Right. And, you know, we have our wishes and it's important that you talk just because mostly, because these are people that care about you. And honestly, if it helps you think about it this way, that it's an alleviation of a burden on the people you care about as well, if they know what you want, because there's an immense amount of guilt if you cannot tell people what you want when they have to make decisions for you. Um, and so if, it, if you can't do it for yourself, okay, because it's too scary, do it for the people you care about, like your parents and your loved ones, because it will help them feel better and they won't carry the burden of guilt for you know, their life. And, and that can sometimes help us get through that process. But use everyday situations, like things you hear, things you see on TV, movies, books, video games, other people's experiences, other DMD dudes, people you know in your family. And like, well, what would you want if that happened to you? Or like, like, how do you think we would navigate that? And like, use it as like hypotheticals, right? It's easy to talk about hypotheticals and to think about that as thought exercises than it is for yourself, right? And that just helps us kind of think about things that are big and that are scary in a way that isn't directly related and anchored to us right now. And like, well, if that happened, this, and that just helps your family understand too, so that if they find themselves in a situation where maybe don't have that flushed out, they have a sense of maybe how you would want to live and what sort of decisions you would want made for you. And I then challenge you to make your parents do the same thing for them, right? And your siblings, and it should be just a normal conversation of how we live life and how we age. And now what I'm curious is what your experiences are, what your elephants are, what the elephants that you have identified or know to be true and the strategies that you find are most helpful in, in kind of navigating adolescence and adulthood and in, in when you have a dysneuropathy. Um, Dr. Truba, you're amazing. <laughs> Always. And fantastic. Uh, I'm trying to adjust the view here so that everybody can be here. And um, yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to talk too much because I want to hear what other people have to say. I talk all the time. Um, I just, I just want to give a huge thank you for um, number one, naming those elephants in the room. Um, and Holy moly, that's a lot. And that's fabulous. And nobody talks about this stuff. So um, thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. I'm going to look at the chat while you're talking real quick because I didn't get to see it while I was talking. And it looks yeah. like there's a whole bunch of stuff here. So I'm not ignoring you. I just want to read through these real quick. No, you're fine. Um, uh, let's see. And yeah, DJ, let's see. Who's here with, I think DJ and Matthew are, are two with Duchenne here. And then I think the rest are our parents or grandparents. <clears throat> so DJ and Matthew will be uh, chatting in the chat with their eye gaze. I do want to ask real quick. Um, 
uh, you've been saying DBMD. So all of this you would say applies for Becker's as well, just on a um, more mild level. I don't even I don't even know if I would say mild. Um, yeah. I okay. see some severe, more severe pheno behavioral phenotypes in Becker's than we do even in Duchenne at times. And so I I just feel like I I don't we don't know enough in that capacity. And I think there's probably a bigger role of secondary gene contributors that I think maybe will elucidate why we sometimes see such a severe presentation in, in Becker behaviorally. Um, and they, yeah, so, so I, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's less severe, but it, I, when I talk about Duchenne and Becker, I kind of talk about them as the same because I feel like there's less, there's less kind of vulnerability likelihood, right? Like there's more boys who kind of do kind of are a little bit more in that, that middle range, but there's a large percentage of them that have a lot of these similar issues to a high degree. And so um, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't really discriminate that. Okay. I had a, a parent reach out to me and ask that. So uh, that's, that's good to know that the answer is completely opposite than what I was going to tell her. So thank you. I mean, I, I think it's logical to say like we would expect it to be less severe because we're producing some dystrophin, but I think again, it comes down to mutation. And, and I think that's what we see about the genomic structure of the dystrophin proteins and kind of like the impact of like what dystrophin isoforms are maybe more intact than others. And, you know, that is going to be part of Becker's too. So I, I just, you know, I don't know if we know enough yet about that. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm aching to hear answers to, uh, to Dr. Truba's questions about elephants in the rooms, your own experience, all that good stuff. Uh, if you would like to come on any parents and um, ask specifically, y'all are welcome to a reminder, this is being recorded. Um, and then DJ and Matthew, I am, I am aching to see what y'all are going to say in the chat. Um, but before then, I did, I did have a question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm still a newbie at this. My son's only 11. Um, but man, I've, I've, uh, I've gotten to know a lot of adults with Duchenne. And they are incredible people. They are fantastic. And um, a lot of this does, does ring true for me. And um, I'm, a, I'm also very grateful for you bringing up the idea of dating and intimacy and sexuality. I'm, um, you know, that weird, crazy mom that's researching this because I want to be prepared for when my son wants to have those sort of relationships and conversations and acknowledging all of the assistance that's needed to make that happen. That would be a great thing just to talk about to at another time. But here's my question, instead of me just talking. Um, you, you talked about, you know, going outside your comfort zone. Um, is there a point at which you jump so far outside of it that you can't learn the skills that you're trying to yeah. So how, how do you, how do you gauge that? And how do you know when you need a pullback? I think knowing you, you will know when you know, <laughs> um, uh, I think it's, it's specific to each person. I think you have to think about it. Like, you know, you know, your sons and that, you know, sometimes better than they know themselves in these moments. And so I think kind of like, I like honesty is the best policy, right? Like, I don't like to just like lie and then push through and then be like, oh yeah, we did this thing. You've done it once you can do it. Um, because like, that doesn't necessarily help either. So I really like, I like approaching it with families where I say, okay, like this is kind of where you seem to tolerate right now. So we're going to like make like an, we're going to make a scale and like our next piece is here. And like, we might be wrong about that. I'm going to like scale it back a bit, but like, we're going to push here. Cause I know you can tolerate this. We're not going to jump all the way here yet. Right. But if, you know, but we're also not going to push you to a place that like, we don't think you can be successful. And if we are struggling, right, like this is how we're going to manage that. And if it doesn't work, then we can abort, but we have to go through these other channels because we know you're not going to like it. We know we're going to want to stop. We know we're going to feel this. And so we have to basically prevent the knee jerk. And then if we've done all the things and we're still not kind of being able to acclimate when we know we should be able to, right, because we know we can tolerate this. So we really should be able to use our skills to bring ourselves back down right? If we, if we're at an age that we can do that and we've prepared for it and we have our procedures and if we can't, then we might have to go back to the drawing board. We might need some other skills then. Right. Um, but if we have our skills, then we really, you know, minor bump in that's, if we're comfortable here, 
a slight increase in dis in distress really should be nav nav we should be able to navigate that right. I really like so um, uh, Matthew made a comment that it's annoying to try to connect with someone every time a relationship doesn't work out and then you have to try to like like reconnect and you put a lot of effort into chasing and and that is something um, that's such a I'm so glad you brought that up uh, because it's a lot of effort and like yeah you do eventually give up because it doesn't it doesn't feel worth it right um, and because you're not in those situations those event those social spaces naturally that that like kind of prevent you from doing that like you're still going to see this person in class every day or you're you know you work with them so you have to kind of you know figure it out even if they did not respond to you um, it's really easy to just stop right? And you're like, all right, I guess I'm just not trying to make friends now, right? Because it's, it's annoying. And it's a lot of effort. Um, and so that's a really real piece. It's hard for anybody as adults to make friends after you get out of college and high school and stuff. Um, but it's easier because of, it's easier to just get yourself into those spaces. And so there is a huge added gap there when you're trying to do that from a distance. Uh, I'll go ahead and read DJ's comment so that uh, people who are watching this recorded can, can hear it. Uh, he says, the hardest thing I find is allowing myself to get fully over stressors that bother me and just allowing them to build up into a full mental breakdown. How does one let things fully go to avoid the complete breakdown? Great question, DJ. That is a great question. Um... couple parts to that. Um, it is hard when you have Duchenne, once your brain and once your body is incredibly dysregulated, it is hard to self-regulate that down. Um, so I don't know you, Mr. DJ, and I don't know your situation and kind of how this happens for you, but if you are the type of individual that kind of, um, kind of like ignores and you're like I'm just gonna ignore and like I'm just gonna tolerate and just get through it and it's just kind of building 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 and then you get to a point that you're like I just can't do this anymore then what would be more helpful okay <laughs> what I would be more helpful is a to recognize that that process of avoidance of, a, of trying to ignore that feeling or that distressing thought um it's actually making it worse and so sometimes what we do is we actually like lean into that feeling we have to learn to kind of like better regulate piecemeal in the moment sequentially versus just hoping our body's like one day just going to be okay with it. Um, because what your body's telling you is I'm not okay with it. And if you keep pushing me, I'm going to get to it here. And if I did that to my body, I might have a panic attack, but my body is going to eventually like calm down because I, my systems are intact and my musculature works real well. And our bodies can literally only stay stressed for so long before panic attacks naturally get better. Um, but when you have dystronopathy, you're not necessarily having panic attacks. You're having sort of a, a disruption in your regulatory system. And so it can be really hard for you to self-manage that on your own and your body doesn't kind of shut down naturally. And so you can kind of stay there a super long time. Um, and so it's a little bit more helpful to do that early in your chain and do that very in, in, uh, specifically and kind of with a plan. Um, and what, what we would do is like either address how you're thinking about it, how you're feeling in the behaviors you're using to kind of help your body regulate. And it might be kind of thinking about that in a stepwise process. And so that once you kind of get to a place that it, it feels manageable, that then you can push into that next stage, because our goal is not to get, to let things go. Right. Because again, I, like I said, like it is potentially a real threat. And the, sometimes the best we can do is learn how to like sit with it in a way that we can still do the things and say like, I don't like this and it makes me feel nervous. And I know, I know I'm okay. I know I've never been dropped. I know that I can get through this. I know I've done this before. And we help our bodies just tolerate it, right? So that we can kind of get through and do the things we wanna do. Um, because if our goal is to not feel, to feel zero and that's the only way that we can do X, like we are really setting ourselves up for failure, my dude. Uh, and <clears throat> There's something uh, that kept coming to mind as you were going through your lecture for me, at least uh, Dr. Trupa, which is there really requires a certain level of um, the ability to distance oneself to get out of that emotion, you know, and to say, okay, that this is going to be okay. Um, 
And I can see how that'll develop over the years. My 11 year old is not there yet. Um, it's hard to do for anybody. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, especially, you know, I, I'm very open about this because I think parents need to hear it. I've gone through my own anxiety and depression. I'm on meds right now. Uh, but that's, um, that's a skill that I feel like meds can help with because sometimes that emotional dysregulation gets so big, you can't do that distancing and you can't find that objectivity. Um, so that's, that's an, an important an important component for sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, a parent uh, asked me to share another elephant in the room is living with COVID. His son spent most of his senior year online, his first year of college online. Hard to build relationships that way. Uh, this week, his sister got COVID from summer camp. The rest of us are fine, but we're all isolating, and his son had to cancel activities too. So, um, yeah, there's, there's a real physical component that has to be taken into consideration. What, what I find at this age for 11 years old, and it gets, gets even more complicated as the guys get older, is um, a fracture. <laughs> a fracture, just walking. And uh, it, it's hard to explain when somebody isn't living this life, how things can change so fast. And no, we, we can't bounce back from that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the, that, I'm really glad whoever brought that up did. Um, I'm kicking myself for not mentioning that because that is a really common thing that has happened for the, 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 the boys who have like really wanted to go to college. They weren't able to, right? Because COVID hit and they had to stay home. And then because they're at such a risk, high risk group, um, they've kind of, that that's extended. And so that's like, I think an even harder place to be because it's wanted and then you, you can't do it. And it, it can make the experience not really feel what you want it to feel. Right. And there's real college experience to going away to college and, and the, and the guys, even though it can be hard that want to do that and you know, they don't want to go to school online. They want to go to school with their peers and to, to be withheld from that when you're, when your other people are going in and having those experiences is just really hard. Um, and I think it's had a huge impact, impact on mental health, because I think there's a, a group of dudes who is really, was really looking forward to some sort of, uh, getting out of the home and, and having some college experiences that just really did not get to not pan out how they had hoped. Oh, it's all, it's all so complicated. And then we toss COVID in. <laughs> We're like, really? Come on. <laughs> COVID isn't likely to go away and we'll still likely be at risk. And then that brings the balance of like, how do we start to think about living life again in a way that's healthy? And what does that look like? And what's a reasonable amount of risk and what's not? And, you know, um, I, I think for those of us in that, that, that want to improve the lives of people that have a, you know, neuromuscular diseases or have a hard time moving or have issues with the respiratory systems, COVID has had a whole other layer of impact than it has for the general population that just isn't considered. Um, and that, you know, because most people don't have to worry about it, like isn't, you know, a huge factor, but it's it's an enormous factor for y'all and, and for thinking about, you know, what what risks am I willing to take? And that's not, you know, being out in public is wasn't a risk until two years ago. And now, you know, just going to the grocery store, you're like, well, I don't know, do I want to, we can get pneumonia or I want to get today? I want to go get some cereal. Like, I don't know. Um, and so, you know, you know, it's, it's a very, you know, different ball game and not everyone's going to get it. And you tell your friends, like, I don't know if I want to do that. It doesn't feel safe. And they're gonna be like, it's not a big deal or whatever. And, you know, then you're navigating, you know, peer dynamics and trying to help them understand something that is just not in their worldview because they don't live it. Um. Yeah, and following up on on Matthew's comment about the uh, the friends, there's just so much. I feel like whenever vicariously from from meeting and knowing other adults with Duchenne, it it feels like there's a huge learning curve. Like Matthew said, for anybody starting to build a friendship with an individual douche, with Duchenne, it can be exhausting for the individual to say, okay, yeah, going through this again, telling them all about this, trying to convince them of this. <laughs> getting them to understand it's real. Um, and so I, I love that 
part, Matthew, I, uh, I know I experienced it, you know, making fumbles with both uh, DJ and Matthew when I got to become their friends, but um, thank you for bringing that up from your perspective. That's, that's amazing. Too. And my little one is telling me it's time. Um, Dr. Truba, uh, you're amazing and wonderful and awesome. And this went far beyond my expectations. This is incredible. <laughs> I was nervous. I was like, I hope this is what, what we're thinking about, but I, I haven't been given an opportunity to, to do a talk like this. And so I did want to kind of get on my feedbacks a bit and talk about some of the things that I think are really big things in this community that the men have not, I don't think have a good platform for kind of sharing because we're all like muscles, 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 which I'm not saying are not important. Um, but you know, there's, there's more to life than muscles. And you know, Dr. Truba, I just have to bring up that one conversation we had, um, how you termed a, a lot of the men, I get, I think you said kind of like in their mid twenties as the lost boys because they're living longer but as you said several times, what life is there to live? They're, they're at home. They can't connect. There's no infrastructure. There's no social infrastructure to support them to get out and do typical adult things. And man, that, that's just stayed with my heart. And I'm so grateful that you're willing to give us your insight and share with us the knowledge limitations. I mean, it helps us to know <laughs> what we're really working with from professionals. So um I will make the plug. Um, I think if we can start to empower more on adaptive technology and adaptive uh, things like that, that can really learn some skills around and take into places that, you know, businesses might not know how to accommodate, but like, if you know, then they don't have to know. Right. Um, and so, you know, we are really working with groups like able gamers to start to get guys set up with adaptive gaming equipment and other things that then open your windows and your your ways to do things and I think that's the trick like and I just I just got done talking to a guy um 24 year old and and we were talking about disability and physical disability and and you know it's it comes to the concept of you know if the world was designed different and we had infrastructure built and there was things that allowed you to you know sh do the things that we know like you all are really smart you're super capable. You just can't like use your hands. Like, okay, well, if we had things in place for that, like you wouldn't be disabled, right? So the environment makes you disabled, not because you can't do, I mean, you can't use your bodies, right? But you're doing, right? Like you're more than capable. So, you know, disability is a socially, you know, it, you know, we made that, we made it, we made you not be able to get in the buildings, we've made it so you can't, you know, easily do work, right? That That's not you issue, that's a society issue. So if we can change those things, right, then I think there's a real possibility that not only are we going to have huge breakthroughs, I think, in science, because these dudes just have a way of thinking about the world and living life and seeing things that I think is awesome, but we're going to be able to do much better do Shen care, because we're going to have the people at the table that know things, like, what the hell do we know? I love that. I love that. And uh, yes, uh, the advocacy for the social structures, you know, uh, our sponsor, Leona Phyllis is my sister-in-law. She's a special needs attorney. And she, she and I have been chatting more about, like you said, that social infrastructure that really limits an individual with Duchenne or a disability from earning a certain amount of money from, you know, forcing them to not accept promotions. Um, you know, getting dinged if you want to get married uh, or even just live with somebody. They're, they're real serious issues. And uh, yeah, we're, we're starting to talk about it and we're, we're helping to, to give skills to try to navigate everything legally, legally. <laughs> um, for those who uh, can't see the chat, um, uh, just to share, uh, a parent said, thank you so much for sharing Dr. Truba. We have been on the wait list to get mental health care for our 13 year old for over a year. This has really helped me understand our son so much more. Thank you and thank you everyone for sharing your experiences. Um, to that parent, if you could let me know what state you're in because Family Friends in Duchenne is working on um, getting qualified counselors in different states. We've got one in Texas, just familiar with Duchenne and we've got one in Indiana. 
who's familiar with Duchenne um, and getting that to y'all either at no cost or a reduced rate. So let me know what state you're in and I'll see what I can do to help get that. I think mental health for our kids and our families are priority, priority. Oh, okay, okay. Um, well guys, uh, my daughter's telling me it's time and uh, we can give Dr. Truba 25 minutes to eat and go do stuff she needs to do before her next responsibility. Um, but typically Dr. Truba says, yep, contact me or her and she'll answer any more questions. Would you like to give that spiel? Yeah, um, I'm happy to answer questions or if I can be helpful, let me know. I have been rather busy, so I do ask for a, a grace window a few weeks. If you haven't heard from me in like three or four weeks, email me again, I, I might've missed or it could be buried or I might have started a form form and response and I got interrupted and then forgot to finish that or send it. So um I don't mean I don't mean to be rude or dismissive. So uh positive intent and, and just follow back up. I'd say I'm not annoyed, I promise. Um, but I will I will do my best to to, to be helpful. Our Dr. Truba is you know, email me like five times sometimes and I'm like, oh I'm so sorry. Um so you know it's okay. I'm not annoyed. <laughs> I'm guilty of that. <laughs> She rolls with it. It's good stuff. Uh, thank you, Dr. Truba, so thank much. So grateful. Yeah, thanks for inviting me to talk about this. I, I, I really am. I, I feel strongly that we really need. We really need to just be loud in in order for for things to start to get done. I mean, unfortunately, you know, this country is not good at doing things when people are passive. So. Uh, well, I'm I'm starting to get a microphone in my hand, so or a megaphone, so hopefully uh, we can get this out and start spreading it throughout our community and uh, you know across the world. So yeah, when you're, when you're ready to to put together an intimacy talk and talking about that kind of stuff, let me know. I I have some other people that are interested, and um, uh, if you build it, they will come. I think with this, so. Awesome. You know what? I that that was in the back of my head, but I've already got you on the hook for for. <laughs> Another potential webinar, and I didn't want to load you up too much. I'm on it. Yes, I am interested in it 100%. Let's email and put me in contact with the people. I, yeah. I have no problems talking about sex for Ermin. I am good with that. Cool. All right. And on that note, <laughs> and a positive note. Yes. <laughs> have a good weekend. Thank you so much for coming. Y'all are great. Thanks for coming. Bye.